So it's 9 a.m. Mm -hmm. So we're going to start um, the Zoom. People are still joining. So as they come in, um, we'll begin. Um, so this script is going to sound vastly familiar for those <laughs> that were here yesterday. Um, but good morning, everyone, and to everyone watching here in New York City, uh, and good evening to our speakers and audience members coming to us virtually from uh, across China. Thank you all for being here uh, for the second day and taking time away from your Saturdays to have a discussion on Chinese urbanism. My name is Victoria Lin, and I'm the uh, co-president of Urban China Network of Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation. On behalf of my team, I extend everyone a warm welcome to day two of the ninth annual Urban China Forum, sponsored by the Urban Planning Program and the Weatherhead East Asian Institute here at Columbia. We extend special thanks to our sponsors and to the support of Columbia Global Centers who are streaming our event through their online WeChat platform. The Urban China Network was found in May 2013 by a group of Columbia urban planning students with a strong interest in China's urban issues. We aim to bring students, scholars, and practitioners from various disciplines here in the U.S. into the discussion of Chinese urbanization and ultimately to facilitate communication between cities in China and that of the world. To speak a little bit more about the special relationship between Columbia's Chinese students and academic scholars, here is Ms. Helena Xiao. Associate Director of Columbia's Global Center, Beijing, who joins us virtually tonight from across from China. Good evening for the second time, Helena. Uh, good evening. Uh, good morning, Victoria, for the second time. Um, good, also, good evening, good morning, uh, good afternoon to all the distinguished friends and, and uh, professors uh, online. So thank you uh, for spending some time with us today. Uh, I'm very honored to be invited to give a very brief uh, remarks, welcome remarks to you for the nice conference of Urban China Forum. I'm representing here of uh, Columbia Global Centers Beijing, which is a regional hub in China of Columbia University. Uh, just very briefly, our mission is to facilitate and promote academic exchange and research collaboration between Columbia student and scholars with their counterparts in the region. Uh, as many of you may know that before 2020, hundreds of student uh, faculty members and administrators participated in various program and events uh, each year in China. So we're uh, you know, really eager to resume that. Uh, if some of you uh, are interested, our office is located in Zhongguancun area on the Upper West side of Beijing. Uh, we would be very pleased to have you visit us while you are in the city. So uh, it is with much pride uh, for me uh, that our student at Urban Planning Department at the Columbia Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation. Uh, like what I mentioned yesterday already, I would love to see it again, one of the best major at the university as well as the, in the country. Um, they have amazingly brought uh, the scholars from Columbia uh, and as well as China uh, and we're facilitating uh, the last day of discussion. So yesterday, uh, we're very glad to hear from uh, 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 Professor uh, Li Tian uh, from Tsinghua University and Professor Wei Feng Li from University of Hong Kong, as well as with the uh, department chair of Columbia uh, Urban Planning, Professor Wei Ping Wu, uh, along with hundreds of uh, online and in person participate. Uh, they had such a, a stimulating discussion um, about their ongoing research work in dealing with the challenges in, uh, in the post pandemic China urbanism. So today, we hope that the new uh, academic insights and best practice presented and discussed will uh, provide us uh, more useful resources uh, and inspirations for us to resolve some um, problems in the real world. Uh, so lastly, I hope that everyone uh, who participated in today's discussion will enjoy it and will be able to have an opportunity uh, to engage with the professors on the questions you are seeking answer to. I also, I'm also looking forward to receiving uh, suggestions and idea on, on how to follow up on the academic exchange and the collaboration in this area uh, with Columbia. Uh, so wish, uh, wish the conference a big success. And now I'll give back the microphone to Victoria. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Helena. And I can't wait to see the events that Columbia Global Centers op like holds now that China is opening up and it's all very exciting. So with that, uh, today well, we have like the theme of our forum is sustainable urban planning. Yesterday, we listened to two wonderful speakers who spoke on their research of the living environment and governance structures that shape the path towards urban sustainable like building. Today, we have three distinguished guests who are speaking on how their work intersects with urban regeneration and transformation. Now that we have exited one crisis, Chinese cities are on the forefront of issues and research that surround the dynamic living and built environments of over 800 million people. Despite the difficulties of on-site research for the past two years, we are joined today with speakers who allow us to continue opportunities of cross-cultural understanding between Columbia University and China. Here to speak a little on our forum is our Urban Planning Program Director, Professor Wei Ping Wu. She's an internationally acclaimed scholar whose book, The Chinese City, offers a multidisciplinary look about the Chinese urban issues we speak about today. Her recent work, China Urbanization Impacts and the Transitions of Interdisciplinary Issues like of Chinese Urban, looks at the inter, like trans, sorry, China, China Urbanization Impacts and Transitions, looks at the interdisciplinary issues of Chinese urbanism from a historical and regional perspective. It is my honor to welcome our very own department chair, Professor Wu. Thank you, Victoria, and thank you, Helena. And um, again, welcome to this uh, Urban China Forum. Uh, I'm just thrilled. I, I want to give give a big round of applause to our students uh, who really uh, put in a lot of efforts and energy to connect with scholars and to um, organize this forum. And you know, the forum has been going on for a number of years now, and I think. Yesterday, we really sensed this hunger, right? You know, we have been separated, of course, involuntarily across regions and across geographies. And I think the our urge and our um, desire for uh, exchange and for learning uh, from each other remains so strong. And I think yesterday when I heard that, you know, thousands of people dial in the uh, WeChat, a live stream and that just speaks to the importance of uh, intellectual um, exchange and so I want to welcome all of you whether you're in person dialing in in zoom or through WeChat um, live stream and yesterday we also were able to see quite a bit alumni from the program and also friends from the past so this also speaks to the urgency about this topic, right? And the cities are obviously at the forefront of confronting not only pandemic, but also challenges brought by climate change, demographic transition. Uh, we know that in China, that's particularly acute, but also environmental transition in which cities in China and elsewhere are experiencing features and phenomena that are both similar to global north cities as well as to global south cities. So we're in a unique time for Chinese cities. For us as scholars and students of Chinese cities to understand better. And we are also at a critical juncture where technology, digital technology, are significantly affecting how cities are governed, cities are managed. Um, we already can see that during pandemic, particularly um, in Chinese cities where um, there's a, a lot of cutting edge use of uh, digital technology. And so I'm very much looking forward to today's presentations. And uh, we have one of our own alum uh, Yun Jing Li now at University of Hong Kong. We have also uh, Nick Smith, a professor now at Barnard. I remember you were at Urban China Forum, uh, I don't know, just before pandemics, right? We were able to do it in person. And then Professor Yang from uh, Nanjing. It really, really is truly also cross-disciplinary. We have geography, urban planning, urban studies, and architecture. So it's a terrific and fertile forum for exchange. And I very much look forward to your um, 
uh, insights and learning from your work. Thank you all. Thank you, Professor Wu. Um, okay, so a gentle reminder to audience that each speaker will have a 30 minute lecture, which will be followed by five minutes of immediate questions. And after both lectures, the discussion panel will be open to a public. Please enter your questions in the chat or use the raise hand functions to indicate you wish to speak. And if possible, please open your cameras so the speakers can see you. Here is uh, my uh, friend and co-president Wei Xiao to like, uh, to introduce our first distinguished speaker and panelist. Good morning and good evening, everyone. And thank you, Victoria. It is my great uh, honor to introduce you to our first forum speaker, Professor Jian Chang Yang. He's a professor in the School of Architecture at Southeast University and an active registered urban planner in China. His research area includes urban regeneration, historic preservation, urban planning, and urban design. Professor Yang has multiple publications, including the theory and methodology of urban regeneration, the urban regeneration in West Europe, urban planning and design, etc. Many of his publications are selected as teaching materials for the urban planning curriculum in China. Besides his distinguished academic reputation, Professor Yang has also led many urban planning and design projects across Chinese cities. Let's welcome Professor Yang. Hello. Thank you, uh, Professor Wu, for your kind of opening. Uh, thank you, uh, Urban China Network, for holding this very important uh, conference. Uh, hello, uh, everyone. Uh, good morning. Uh, good evening. Uh, today, I'm uh, very uh, pleased. I'm very uh, glad to uh, introduce uh, my research on urban regeneration in China. I come from uh, Southeast University. Uh, I'm Professor Yang. Urban regeneration has been a significant topic for urban planner around the world since the Industrial Revolution. After more than uh, 13 years of rapid urban development, China urbanization has shifted from uh, high-speed growth to middle-high-speed growth. Now, urban development in China is transitioning from uh, faster modernization to uh, stage well is uh, designed for its people by the quality of life. In the current stage, urban regeneration has become a top uh, priority in social economic development. It is also a lively food project closely related to the well being of the people and uh, improvement of life quality. Today, I will uh, uh, talk about uh, three main sections. Section one, a uh, historical review of urban regeneration in China. Section two, the goal and the characteristic of urban regeneration uh, three, uh, talk about uh, planning paths towards sustainable urban regeneration. Part one, the de uh, development history of urban regeneration in China. We know in the early days 
of the funding of the People Republic of China. The main task of urban regeneration was to improve the basic living environment and the conditions of urban residents. With the establishment of a market economy system in the post-reform era, urban planners began to carry out a large scale restructuring of old city and the renovation of old residential area. In the rapid urbanization period, there is a regeneration of old districts, the culture and the creativity lead redevelopment of old industrial area and the conservation of historical area. Today, we have entered a transitional period which emphasizes people-centered and high-quality development. Now, I will introduce more detail. First one uh, is from uh, 1949 to 1977. It uh, focuses on improving the basic environment, sanitation, and the living condition of the city. Most uh, of all the urban area was uh, built under the police of making, uh, you, uh, making full use and uh, gradually transforming. There are many great projects uh, for example, the renovation of Long Xu Go in Beijing, the renovation of Santi Tang in Shanghai, and the uh, improvement of the Qinghai River in Nanjing. During this time, uh, Ms. Liang Shicheng and Ms. Chen Zhangxiang proposed the famous Liang Chengxuan. They try to solve the problem of uh, conflict between the urban development and uh, historical preservation. They offer new idea for holistic urban regeneration. First two, uh, from uh, 19, uh, 78 to 1989, both on addressing housing uh, shortage and uh, repair infrastructure deaths, with the uh, loan of landmark uh, reform, urban regeneration has increasing become a key issue. There are uh, many uh, uh, projects and the works, for example, uh, the renovation of the old city in Shenyang, uh, the renovation of the old city in Hefei in Nanjing, and there are other famous projects uh, in Beijing, uh, for example, Zhuo Futong, and the renovation uh, of old and neighborhood in Suzhou. Uh, it also includes uh, the renovation of the East Nanjing Road in Shanghai, and so on. Uh, the two uh, people is very famous. Uh, we know Professor Wu Liangyong. He work in uh, Tsinghua University. He proposed the organic regeneration theory. This theory lead a fundamental change of uh, urban development from uh, demolish and uh, construction to organic regeneration. He put out a new direction for China. Another uh, uh, professor is uh, Professor Wu Mingwei. 
he worked uh, uh, in our school in Southeast University. He proposed a uh, comprehensive and uh, systematic thinking on urban regeneration. Uh, he played uh, an important role in guiding urban regeneration practice. Post three uh, is from uh, 1919 to 2011. Along with the land reform and the commercialization of housing, the urban regeneration had been promoted by strong economy movement momentum. Uh, it also many. Uh, a uh, great uh, work and uh, project uh, include uh, uh, Shanghai Tian Zhi Fang, Shanghai Qing Tian Di, and uh, Beijing uh, Qi Jiu Ba. It also include uh, a project uh, Pinjiang Road in Suzhou and uh, World Expo Park in Shanghai and so on. And uh, uh, first of all, uh, from uh, 2012 to present, uh, it uh, opened up a new dimension of people-centered and uh, high-quality development. There is a new situation of multiple type, level, and uh, perspectives. Now we will discuss uh, some uh, question about uh, what's the value and uh, what's the characteristic and what's the goal uh, of urban regeneration. Please look at this uh, uh, picture. This is a, a schematic diagram of comparative analysis on the level of urbanization development of China and the world in the past 14 years. Uh, look at the race line, it's a uh, right line, is a trend of China urbanization, right? The blue line is the trend of world urbanization, right? Uh, in China, in uh, 2011, the urbanization that excited 15% uh, uh, and uh, after 10 years, it re, uh, reached about 16.4%. Uh, In the new stage, the state proposed the urban regeneration action. Uh, in today, uh, urban regeneration was writing in the national government work report for the first time, it began uh, the new, new time. About the action uh, connotation, uh, in my opinion, uh, I say uh, the city is a living organism and the urban development is a uh, organic and uh, ever change process. Urban regeneration is not only a construction activity, but more importantly, a mechanism for regulating urban development. And urban regeneration, uh, of course, in uh, Wolf, uh, where various aspects of society, economy, and the physical environment. It is a, a comprehensive politic, policy-oriented and a, a strategic social setting project. What's the venue, I think, uh, under the overall framework of the new national governance system, urban regeneration 
has become more focused on the internal development of city. So as an important part of the urban development work, urban regeneration, of course, involves more comprehensive over, overall objectives and uh, uh, many goals, uh, include uh, uh, six uh, factors. One, uh, improving the function, make the city development healthier and safer. Uh, two, optimizing the structure to make the urban development more intensity and compact. And three, uh, inheriting culture and make urban development more harmonious and elegant. And four, uh, protecting the environment and make urban development more ecological and sustainable. About uh, uh, urban uh, quality, improve the uh, quality and uh, make the city more livable and uh, beautiful. In the end, is uh, enhancing vitality and make the city more prosperous and uh, diverse. Okay, uh, I will uh, introduce uh, for you uh, and discuss uh, planning paths uh, toward sustainable urban uh, regeneration with uh, today's uh, practice. Uh, planning path one uh, is a uh, focus on the adjustment and uh, optimization of the overall functioning structure of the city. Uh, we know uh, today Beijing's overall plan goal is to build a world class harmony and a livable city. It uh, uh, transforms the traditional model of urban development is driven by incremental expansion. Uh, this is a top level design, uh, include uh, strictly control the increase in quantity. The return is the uh, stock, optimize structure and uh, enhancing uh, efficiency. Uh, look at this picture. I take this picture uh, last year. Uh, this is a view of the uh, old city, uh, Beijing, uh, from the Jinsang uh, Park. This uh, last uh, picture is the view uh, of West Mountain. It's also from uh, Jinsang Park. Uh, we can see uh, in Beijing, uh, the special environment and the quality of all the city have been well improved. Because uh, it's through the uh, the construction of over functionality and uh, many uh, uh, efforts in Shanghai. Uh, Shanghai is uh, thriving to build into a city of innovation, a city of people, city of ecology, is in uh, three dimension. Uh, dimension one uh, is city participants, uh, dimension uh, city charm, dimension sustainable development. And look at this uh, picture. Uh, with the development uh, of creating a uh, world class world uh, from the area, uh, Shanghai proposed planning studies in terms of function layout, public space, green ecology, skyline, comprehensive transportation, 
and the municipal facility uh, this strategy enhance the uh, urban quality along the Huangpu River and the Suzhou River. Now uh, we uh, talk about the uh, planning pass two. Uh, pass two uh, is about uh, highlighting the creation and the enhance of human public space. Uh, Nanjing city wall is very famous and uh, very typical in China's Asian capital city. In accordance with people's city for the people, we created a human public space through the protection and the improvement of the area along the old city wall. Uh, during this year, we make a, a master plan and the start uh, city planning include uh, pedestrian system, motor vehicle system, facility service, and the landscape design guide. We uh, please look at this picture. Uh, it's a uh, Old city wall is an area along the city wall. Uh, today is a built for the city park for children, for our people. Uh, these plan stages uh, are in terms of history and the culture, and public space, and the green, uh, and the leisure and uh, recreation and uh, integrated transformation uh, and so on. They enhance the uh, quality of the environment. Uh, this picture uh, is uh, uh, for old city. It's a view uh, from uh, the city of the wall. Uh, it's beautiful and uh, fantastic. Okay, uh, pass three. Uh, pass three is uh, uh, proven and uh, uh, proven uh, and enhance the living environment and the living condition of all the labor food. This is the regeneration of all the labor food in all the city in Nanjing. As the most uh, uh, basic living unit of the city, so all the labor food are uh, intensive and complex. Uh, in the old uh, district, there are many traditional uh, houses and uh, rich heritage. Under the guidance of the planning, we introduced a small scale and a progressive approach to renovate Santi Town, or the three space and the uh, landscape environment. Based on public participation, we also fully respect the, the view of the government, the resident, the development, and the uh, other party. In other city, they also make use of abandoned land to create a small and a micro activity. Uh, look at this picture. It's a this public uh, uh, open space is for uh, old men, old women uh, saying uh, this uh, public space uh, is for people. Uh, creation uh, and the leisure and so on. In the course of building a residence sense of belonging and uh, identity, the community planner uh, are become uh, more and more important. Uh, this is a uh, many uh, activity for uh, participation. 
Now, uh, I will uh, uh, talk about the uh, past three, uh, past uh, four. Uh, past four uh, is strengthening the protection and the revitalization of urban history and uh, culture. Uh, look at the risk picture. It's the view uh, is scenery of Suzhou. Uh, we know uh, Suzhou is a uh, shipping in history, his uh, cultural heritage and the beautiful landscape and garden. The historic district is a uh, embodiment of the city's traditional cultural and uh, custom. In urban development, uh, this historical area are the most important and uh, valuable. On the premise of overall protection, we started a, a comprehensive capacity model to determine the reasonable uh, density of construction in the old city. Uh, therefore, organic regeneration will be carried out uh, to promote the uh, way Tenity and uh, sustainable development of the old city. In line with the urban development strategy of protect the old city, develop the new area, and the policy of comprehensive protection of old city, uh, Suzhou has a preserve. Uh, preserve very well uh, the traditional style, traditional uh, appearance. Uh, it also the double uh, chess board special pattern of uh, uh, Palanite water and the land uh, adjacent to the river and the street. Uh, look at the this picture, uh, it's a view from the Pinjang Road. Is a Pinjang uh, Gano. Uh, is a, a very famous uh, traditional house. Uh, is a famous garden of Wan Shiyuan. Uh, this shrinkage uh, enhances the value and the quality of the Asian city. In the end, I will introduce uh, planning paths. Uh, five. Uh, past five is uh, promoting and uh, upgrading of industrial structure in all the industrial area. Uh, Beijing Shougang Industrial Zone is very famous. It uh, uh, retains the current industrial element strong reasonable function replacement and uh, cultural uh, remodeling. It's very successful. It's a, a successful uh, case uh, from uh, all the steel mill to the Winter Olympic. In uh, this year, uh, it is successful uh, hosted uh, the uh, 24th Winter Olympic Games. Uh, you look at this picture, uh, it's a Gu Ailing, it's a Su Yiming, uh, it's very good. Uh, during uh, this time, uh, the Sogang area has created a condition for the great transformation and uh, inject a new vitality to the industrial heritage. Uh, another case is uh, uh, conservation and the regeneration of the old industrial town of Tanza uh, in Nantong. Tanza is uh, very famous, is the uh, first modern industrial town in China. It built in uh, 
1886, uh, in our research, we try to uh, build a balance between conservation and uh, regeneration. We make up a, a multi objective, include uh, preserve the heritage, uh, finding new model for economy development, and uh, create a local job. Uh, it also include improving living condition. Uh, it's also is very important for us to attract young people uh, and so on. Uh, this is a, a situation uh, for today is a before uh, is after uh, uh, is a before is after. Uh, this plan uh, effectively promote the conservation utilization in industrial transformation and uh, quality improvement for uh, this area. Through a great effort of many year, uh, years, it pre, uh, preserve very well uh, many heritage, upgraded all the industry and uh, attracted uh, uh, more and more uh, people, uh, especially young people to go, uh, go back to the old town. Okay. Uh, finally, uh, I will uh, make up a conclusion. In China, there are uh, four phases because uh, different uh, background, there are different uh, approach, uh, different uh, mechanism, uh, different uh, uh, regeneration folks, and uh, different uh, regeneration policy for uh, each phase, it's a very uh, important for recognize, in my opinion, urban regeneration is a comprehensive, holistic policy oriented and the city social setting project. It is also necessary to establish the uh, guiding uh, ideology of people orient oriented uh, to face a long term and more comprehensive overall goal of pro promoting urban civilization and uh, harmonious social development. It is very important to explore urban regeneration planning paths from a social, economy, social, and the cultural dimensions, as well as from a macro, medium, and a micro level. In the end, we hope to establish a good cooperation and carry out the academic exchange in the field of urban regeneration, focus on old uh, labor food, old industrial area, historic preservation, urban regeneration team, and so on. We hope to promote sustainable, diversified, healthy, and harmonious development of urban regeneration. In the end, we also hope to uh, create a better life for human beings. That's all. Thank you for listening. Thank you, uh, give me time. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, okay, thank you, Professor Yang. Your talk reminds me of the refurbishment of the historical sites of the general consoles in my hometown, Nanjing, the Yihe Lu Gongguan Xu, which is next to my elementary school. 
Uh, this urban renewal project now is one of the city level. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, this urban renewal project now becomes a label of Nanjing City and brings us the fabulous confidence in our culture. Uh, we have received several questions on WeChat. Uh, do you mind answering them? Yeah, thank you, Professor. And um, if it's more comfortable for you, um, you can use Chinese uh, to answer the questions and we will um, post the English translation on our um, account uh, later for those questions. So uh, we have received a couple of questions on the WeChat um, platform uh, for audiences from Hong Kong. We have received a couple of questions from the WeChat platform for audiences from Hong Kong. The first question is, how do you handle the impact of the impact of the impact of the 这位在香港的观众他提他呃提出说啊、呃，他觉得现在的政府并没有呃提出有效的措施来呃应对呃一些老化的呃高层建筑。那您对呃您觉得对于嗯、呃、这个问题从城市更新的角度啊、呃、有何见解呢？谢谢。好，谢呃 ，OK 呃。呃，因为这个问题非常复杂，要我要不还是用中文来回答、啊？呃，可以吗？没有问题，可以。<笑>呃，因为在每个地区，它的城市更新的问题都非常复杂，是吧？而且有它的特殊性。呃，像在呃香港，它这些高层的住宅，呃，因为为了应对它的城市的这样一个急剧的发展。呃，建了大量的这种高层住宅，但高层住宅的更新是非常的难，是吧？因为它的结构，是吧？还有建筑的造价，呃，会花费很大的，呃，这样一些资金，是吧？呃，包括它的里面的一些人口的结构，是吧？在将来在更新改造过程中，呃，也需要呃给予高度的关注，是吧？呃。呃，这些问题，比如说在上海，实际上也面临，是吧？包包括在南京，呃，都都面临这些问题。呃，现在呢，就是说，我们国家也是在制定了如何呃一些更新的一些呃绿色更新的一些政策，包括一些绿色更新的一些呃技术方法，呃，包括一些法律法规的一些方面的一些制定啊。好，谢谢。嗯。So there, we also receive a question from um, Zoom. In Zoom, we also received a question from Richard Jordan. Um, I'll say it in English first, and I'll do the Chinese translation. Um, question for Professor Yan. Um, the dean of UN non-governmental representatives for 43 uh, years, the United Nations adopted the new urban agenda on October 20th. Um, 2016, to your knowledge, are schools of architecture in China incorporating the new urban agenda in student courses? Thank you. Um, the United States in 2016, the but您看来，呃，国内的建筑院校是否将这项议程，呃，结合到了呃授课的过程当中，就是对于学生来说。对你说的是那个呃人居那个议程，呃，这个我们呃在中国上已经高度的关注，而且完全融入到我们的课程里
um, to propose and to think about new policies for urban regeneration at the city scale of how we um, promote the sustainable development of um, the country and the city. So to your question, yes, um, it is an in progress. Um, and um, I think it will um, for sure be uh, developed in uh, the future uh, curriculum as well. And um, 我其实也有一个比较个人的问题想问一下杨教授可能是非物质性的用现代的建筑手段去做一些比较看起来有历史性的一些建筑您对于这个在通过这个可持续性发展的视角您有什么见解吗因为现在的保护呢历史的文化所以在未来而且让群众更好地去体验他的文化是杨教授好所以我想问的一个问题是关于您说到的那个第三个路径就是这个城中的老小区的改造因为最近我也在做一个这样的研究就是看这个老旧小区里边的改造内容之后就发现在这个就跟以往很不一样的就是它的这个资
，这样不同的这种呃筹资的这个方式，就往往就会影响到了有些项目就很容易落地，很容易实行。其他的就不太容易，或者说在这种居民的互相的沟通和取得一个最后共同的意见上，就会遇到一些问题。所以我就是挺感兴趣，就是想问一问这种微小尺度上的这种城市改造，尤其是这个老旧小区的改造，目前它有没有新的一些？集资的方式，或者是一些财政上面的创新政策，去支持这个第三条路的这个往前推呢？嗯、谢谢你。啊，谢谢。呃，你说的问题，呃，非常呃典型，在中国也是非常难解决的问题。因为现在我们国家的老旧小区的改造，呃，可以说面广量大，是吧？而且呃，直接跟呃群众的生活呃利益直接相关，是吧？那么在这里面一些小的改造，呃，你刚才说的加装电梯啊，立面的一些，呃，整治啊，呃，都非常关键，是吧？这些看似非常微小，但实际上跟群众呃日常的呃需求啊，或对这种美好生活的一种需求啊，直接相关，是吧？那么在这里面呢，实际上国家一个可以借助那个国家的一些财政的投资，是吧？但这个量因为太大，是吧？那么还有一个就是说，现在国家也在研究说如何，呃，吸收这种社会资本，来来引入，是吧？当然这里面需要有个非常好的这个机制，是吧？就是说在这里面，呃，比如说在里面，呃，小区里面的一些开发权的一些转让，是吧？或者一些，呃，盈利性的项目如何跟他，呃，统一的考虑。是吧？那这需要还要打通这样一个政策的路径啊。呃，当然还有在这里面呢，就是说，包括现在呃，比如说北京是吧，也有很多小区开始呃，在像那个劲松小区是吧，呃，开始比如说国家呃开发银行呃给予大量的资金的投入是吧？还有社会上的一些资金的投入。呃，总的来讲呢，就是说呃，在资金的筹纳上面，它应该是广泛的。是吧？采取多种路径，是吧？当然，这里面最关键就是还有就是说要有政策跟制度的保障，是吧？但这呃不可能是呃完全是，如果是一个个案，那可能很难推行。现在更多呢，就是说要制定这种呃对全国是吧有普遍意义的这种制度的建设，可能更为重要。好，我不知道是不是呃，谢谢您，那回答你的，谢谢，谢谢啊。呃，好的，谢谢杨教授。呃，由于杨教授后续还有一个活动需要参加，呃，所以呃，杨教授，呃 ，feel free to leave if if you um want to catch up your next schedule. Um, now we have the second speaker, and it's a great honor for me to introduce her, Doctor Yun Jingli, also an alumni of Columbia GSAP. Doctor Li is a postdoc, uh, postdoc fellow in the Department of Geography at University of Hong Kong. Her research focuses on low carbon city planning and urban climate governance. Dr. Li's, uh, this is at Columbia University to Shenzhen as a case study to explore the concept of low carbon city and its in implementation in Chinese cities through the lens of urban governance. She also previously worked with the United Nations Population Fund and the UN Habitat on environmental sustainability issues as well as the Urban Technical Assistance Project, a Columbia initiative that aims to provide support for inner city communities. Now let's welcome Dr. Li to give us a talk in sustainability. Thank you. Also, a uh, great thanks to Professor Yang again. Okay, thank you for your introduction and thank you for having me today. Uh, so I'm trying to share my screen. Let's see. So can you give me a thumb up if you can see my screen? Yes, we can. Um, if you if you like, you can uh, uh like unraise your hand so that emoji is uh, on the top okay. right of your screen again. <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. So let me just uh, put down my hands. So where is it? It should be on the bottom at reactions, the button. Uh, I'm, I'm, 
the but like so on the tab with the share screen, there's record, share post screen. captions, e reactions, and just unraise your hand. So let me just uh, uh, exit from this and then. Pardon everyone, we're having a little bit of a technical difficulty, but it wouldn't oh, be sorry as about that. So let me, um, and let so me on, the on the bottom. Yes, share screen uh, next to it on the right is record, closed captions and reactions. And you can just click on the but reactions button and you should be able to. Okay, yeah, let me it. stop share screen first and then uh, a reaction, right. So. Now, Perfect. how is it? Yes. Okay, yes. so let me share again. Uh, so sorry about this technical problem I caused. <laughs> it wouldn't be a Zoom conference without it. <laughs> All right, okay. That's, that looks perfect. So this is it, right? Uh, hello, everyone. So today I'm going to uh, share uh, a research uh, I've done recently, and it is based on my uh, doctoral uh, dissertation, uh, which received tremendous uh, help from Columbia Urban Planning Program and Professor Wu Wei Ping. So this is what I did based on that. And after I moved to Hong Kong, I just built on uh, my previous research and then move a step ahead uh, to look at this whole concept and phenomenon of the low carbon cities. And today I'm going to talk uh, about uh, a couple of the things. Uh, first, I'd like to provide a very brief introduction uh, of the short history of the low carbon city movement in China. And I'm going to introduce uh, the existing theory and conception of this particular phenomenon in urban China. And I'm going to introduce more about the, uh, the present research, which is going to see low carbon city from a perspective of the environmental state and uh, the methodology of how I can, uh, I explore this topic from uh, a standpoint of the legal disputes. And if time allows, I'd like to uh, maybe uh, tell a very interesting story of the two uh, neighboring cities to uh, pursue uh, similar low carbon city experiments, but with very divergent outcomes. And uh, in the end, there is a conclusion. So my research in low carbon cities is uh, inspired by the sudden surge of the low carbon city as an idea and as a mega project category across different cities in China. And uh, this picture shows maybe this is the uh, day one of low carbon city in China. And you can guess the time of it uh, is back in 2008 and it's at maybe the most globalized uh, moment. And this is the first uh, low carbon city initiative, which is led by the Worldwide Fund for Nature uh, in conjunction with the HSBC and the department, uh, the NDRC. And at that time, they selected two cities of Shanghai and Baoding as the two pilot low carbon city, uh, which is going to be implemented in the following years. And this is the launch ceremony where uh, the representatives from the different entities join together and uh, smash the balloons uh, labeled with the CO2. And that is the first introduction of the idea of the low carbon city uh, in China. And after that, this a practice of low carbon city just spread very quickly. And we can see during the year uh, of the 2011 to 2015, there are more than 200 cities who set explicit uh, carbon reduction targets in their five year plans. And by 2014, there are uh, more than 130 cities had a very ambitious plan of developing as low carbon cities. And more recently as the uh, 
double carbon policy uh, gain momentum. So we can see more ambitious goal in the name of the carbon peaking city or carbon neutral city, uh, which uh, indicate a more uh, ambitious and more urgent imperative to control the territory CO2 emissions at a city level. And uh, this is actually not a very China specific phenomenon. Uh, and indeed, it is a very a global trend where we can see the higher and higher visibilities of the city uh, in the domain of climate governance. So this can go back to the very early uh, 2000, uh, 2000s uh, when the nation state uh, which are the established actors to lead climate governance under the global framework of the UNFCCC met uh, difficulties in reaching an agreement. So cities just stand up and this uh, pace just uh, get a um, um, new momentum after the Copenhagen summit, which is considered a total failure uh, for nation states to agree on and commit to a global uh, agreement after the Kyoto Protocol, uh, which is going to end in 2010. So at that time, several mayors just stand up and speak out the need for uh, cities to take the response and the discourse at that, at that moment is a very uh, contradictions between cities and the nation state and while nations talk, cities act. That is a very uh, popular and wide circulated uh, slogan at that time to uh, portray cities as maybe the last hope and maybe one of the most appropriate uh, solutions to climate crisis. And this trend uh, of the uh, linkage between cities and climate change is increasingly institutionalized under the global framework of the UNFCCC. And um, the most, one of the most recent step it takes is in the uh, Glasgow uh, summit last year, where there is an initiative to advocate for a specific uh, summary for urban policy mayors in the IPCC annual report, which is the scientific foundation for all climate related uh, policy making. So this just take the urban policymaker as a particular group of the audience which IPCC is going to be delivered and to see the urban scale as a particular uh, scale and site and agent to uh, deliver the policy related to the global climate issues. And in the academic world, this phenomenon uh, to linking cities and climate change attracted increasing attention from scholars from different uh, fields, such as the uh, urban study, urban culture, urban sociology, and geography. And, uh, and this has uh, developed into a very established uh, strand of the literature to look at uh, climate urbanism. And this particular strand of the uh, somehow critical urban uh, studies, they looked at the nature uh, of the climate urbanism and what it uh, embodies and what kind of the strategies it used and what is the implications for the development and the governance of the cities. And there is an overall consensus that the climate urbanism works very easily and conveniently with the conventional idea of the city competitiveness uh, and ecological safety based on how city can sustainably develop their economy and uh, maintain the social uh, well-being of the uh, the urban uh, the residents. So this is the uh, notion of the uh, climate urbanism, and this remotely echoes uh, the earlier argument. Uh, and thesis of the urban sustainability fix to see this as the leverage of the environmental agenda to promote the traditional goal and the traditional uh, motivation of increase the economic 
uh, growth and global competitiveness of the cities in a very globalized world. And this is the grand, uh, sometimes under the name of the green uh, branding uh, to uh, add the green color uh, as a framing strategy and as a, a competitive edge uh, in the global cities. And following this kind of the thinking, um, one main uh, line of the discussions on uh, China's low carbon urbanism uh, just is inspired uh, by this kind of the global notion of the climate urbanism. And it usually started with the, uh, the, the theoretical framework, uh, framework of the policy mobility to see how the idea is transmitted to China through different platforms and networks, especially the municipal climate networks, and the, how the channels of the technology transfer and policy learning uh, and knowledge transfer uh, helps to facilitate this process of the growth of the low carbon cities. At the same time, uh, it is realized that uh, the particular urban political economy in China, which combines the land politics, uh, the how the municipal finance works based on urbanization and makes uh, based on the change of the land uses from farmland to urban construction land. So this particular dynamics in urban China just interacts with how the global networks, uh, how the mobility of the actors, of the resources, of the knowledge, so how they come together uh, to become the driving forces uh, behind China's low carbon cities. But this cannot uh, explain fully why so many cities with the very diverse uh, development stages and also the social economic characteristics will suddenly at the same time set a similar goal and accept or embrace the same vision of the urban development in the future. So there is an alternative theoretical framework to see the rise of low carbon urbanism in China. And this is to see whether the low carbon city heat is uh, motivated by an authoritarian uh, environmentalism. This is how the state can use its uh, top-down dynamics of the power exertion to push local governments to pursue the path of the low carbon urban development. And there are two very apparent institutions that can help explain and support this hypothesis. One is the target responsibility system, which allows the central government to allocate a carbon reduction to provincial uh, governments, and then provincial governments have the choice to further uh, allocate this provincial level target to lower levels of the government. So this top-down uh, target responsibility system uh, in, together with the, uh, China's uh, local cadre evaluation, which uh, established carbon reduction as one mandatory indicator in local uh, government's uh, official evaluation. So this is one of the institution. And the other is the very well-known uh, pilot program uh, initiated by the NDRC to designate particular cities as the pilot low carbon cities. And from 2010, there are a total of the three batches, which include 81 cities in this program of the low carbon city pilot program. And this is only one of the many uh, programs uh, led by different ministries who have uh, which have some relation more or less relation to low carbon for example the sponge city uh, initiative and low carbon transportation city program so there are multiple uh, initiatives and programs going on uh, by at the central level and they are choosing particular cities to develop as low carbon cities. So uh, these two lines, uh, two very different parallel 
uh, explanations of the low carbon city uh, actually existed for a while to explain the overall environmental turn of China in the past decade. So whether this is a global phenomenon and dominated by the neoliberal globalization and urbanization project to um, increase the competitiveness of the city using the green framing, using the green technology, or it is a product of a particular type of the state uh, and it is approach to environmental issues. And uh, despite very different perspectives of these two uh, theoretical frameworks, uh, I find that both of them just focus on very uh, micro level uh, dilemmas and see the power of the capital or the power of the state as almighty and as penetrating into uh, different aspects and different places in across China. And uh, it's very useful to think about uh, the, the rise of the low carbon cities at one hand, but on the other hand, it falls short of explaining why uh, the effectiveness of low carbon city development varies across different places in China. So uh, in my um, doctoral dissertation, that is what I looked at. So I looked at, at the low carbon city as a discursive project and explored how the discourse of low carbon city is formed and is utilized and what kind of the resources are leveraged by this particular discourse and what kind of the effects, what kind of the outcomes can be related to the utilization of this low carbon uh, this course. And I find that maybe this discursive project project uh, perspective provides some useful uh, information to bridge uh, the, the mainstream, the two kinds of the, uh, the explanations from the globalization and uh, authoritarian environmentalism because the discourse of the low carbon plays as a glue uh, to uh, expand the coalition or build the alliances of different actors who commit to uh, the project of low carbon city development and contribute different kinds of the resources and to reach a very temporary but very instrumental consensus uh, to uh, go on the path of the low carbon city development. And these findings also include the kind of the new actors involved in this picture and how the power relations uh, remain somehow the same and how the new actors uh, in climate finance, in climate uh, technology, they are absorbed into the traditional power hierarchies in the government uh, of the city government and also uh, the central local uh, dynamics. And all these findings point to uh, a point that the nation state uh, is playing a very strategic role uh, in this kind of the low carbon city development. In other words, in China, low carbon city is not only about the city, it's about um, how city interact with the nation state, with the central government, because the national agenda of the low carbon development. And this uh, role, the relationship between the urban climate mitigation and adaptation, and also on the other side is the nation state, their relationship is subject to ongoing uh, discussion and the role of the nation state is very ambiguous. Uh, so on the, on the one hand, the rise of the city is often considered as a result of the slow move of the nation state or withdrawal of the nation state uh, from the environmental issue. And there is also the discussion of the nation state's destined environmental failure because of the in, uh, internal contradiction uh, of the environment and economic development uh, in the uh, nation state. And 
On the other hand, so in the, uh, if we follow this line of the discussion, we can see the nation state is not put, uh, playing a very uh, important or significant role uh, in that city because it's close to uh, closeness to the civil society as well as to the market. They can provide more effective and innovative solutions to environmental crisis like climate change. But on the other hand, as urban climate experiments, the initiatives taken by the city, they do not always end up in success. And, uh, and, uh, and actually there are more failing uh, stories uh, to be told uh, for the city-led climate programs. And when the scholars to look into uh, this, um, gap between the promise of the cities uh, to solve climate crisis and the reality uh, on the ground, they always point to and notice the embeddedness of cities uh, in the higher level of governments. And also the national uh, politics will cast a very significant influence on cities to pursue uh, ambitious climate goals and to uh, provide innovative climate solutions. So this uh, two different uh, perspectives just point to a very uh, understudied uh, aspect of what is the role of the nation state? What is the relationship between a greening state uh, and urban climate governance. So for this present research, uh, the goal, the objective of the research is to explore the dynamics of urban climate experiments within the context of an emerging decarbonization focused environmental state. And there are two research questions. The first is how is the low carbon environmental state articulated and contested on the ground? And second, how does this process of articulation and contestation affect the efficacy of urban climate initiatives? So a practical goal for this research is to identify or to explore the reasons why there is the long lasting and widely observed gap between the promise of urban climate governance and the disappointing reality. And uh, the environmental state, this is a widely uh, discussed, uh, discussed concept to, because um, although there is the discussion of the environmental uh, failure of the nation state, so there is the consensus that the state can restructure and reconfigure to focus on or to give more priority to the environmental issue. And this environmental state uh, denotes a process for the nation states to turn more attention to the environmental and to develop the regulatory regime to integrate more environmental concerns into the social economic development of the society. And this refute interest is, uh, actually started from the very uh, early, the mid 2000s. And so far there is an ongoing debate about what is an environmental state? Is it a normative idea with a very uh, clear defined uh, end or it is a dynamic process uh, composing, uh, composed of the uh, institutionalization of the environmental concerns and issues? And um, mostly there is the assumption or a conventional idea of the environmental state as uh, the power exertion from the top to the local level, and also through very formal channels, mainly the regulation, the redistribution and organization and knowledge management, these four particular domains uh, for the environmental state building. And this can, um, be uh, fit into China's context not easily. And uh, I'd like to uh, take an alternative understanding of the environmental uh, state. So instead of this uh, cascading flow of the power exertion and the 
domain of the power exertion, I'd like to uh, suppose that environmental state is, it entails a contested process. And with the emergence of, of a new priority, a new imperative of climate mitigation of carbon reduction, there will be different perception of the, this national agenda or global agenda across different uh, scales and administrative levels. And the cross-scale and cross-level dynamics will determine the outcomes of the climate governance at a very local. And that will be uh, explaining factor to, uh, uh, to somehow explain uh, the success or effectiveness of the urban climate by experiments. And also my understanding of the environmental uh, state does not only include uh, the power uh, exerted through formal channels, but also to extend this understanding of the power uh, as exerted uh, through informal ch channels and in particular the discursive and performative dimensions of power. So this, uh, extension, uh, extended understanding of the power uh, is particularly uh, important when we see China's issues because uh, as the scholar O'Brien uh, acknowledged that the national policy may cover far murkier realms such as the pledges made by officials on inspection tours, party propaganda and the spirit of the center in its dictatorship uh, style governance context. And this is a particularly true in the area of the climate governance. So uh, before maybe a, um, the most recent uh, and what we are familiar with is the rise of the double carbon policy, just following the pledge of President C to uh, announce and commit to the international community that China will achieve a carbon peak uh, by two, uh, 2030 and then carbon neutrality by 2060. And long before that, actually uh, back in uh, 2010 to 2015, uh, when the cities set explicit carbon reduction goals. That is a direct result of the pledge made by uh, the then Premier Wen at, uh, uh, at the Copenhagen summit to commit uh, internationally the China's uh, ambition and decision to uh, pursue for climate mitigation. So this kind of the, uh, the, the informal uh, uh, pronouncements and also the uh, leader speeches, they always, they have always played a very uh, essential role in um, determining the direction and the speed of the progress of climate governance and climate policy making uh, in China. And beyond China, this is not, uh, this is also can be seen as the climate politics is increasingly manipulated and utilized uh, as a strategy election politics in the Western democracy context. So this attention to the discursive and the promovative dimensions of power is very important uh, to understand the operation and functioning of the environmental state uh, in the field of the climate governance. And the following this conception uh, of the environmental state, uh, uh, this is a research uh, which I collaborate with Professor George Ling at uh, Hong Kong U, and we de uh, developed this conceptual framework uh, of a decarbonized, uh, decarbonization for the environmental state. So this framework is structured around two dimensions. The first horizontal dimension is how uh, this new value and new um, norms and principles created by the carbon control is applied. So the temporal characters, whether it is applied to prescribe or prevent future events and particular activities in the future, or it is applied to redefine, reassess and rejudge the past or ongoing the existing activities on the ground. And the, along the vertical, uh, 
that I mentioned, there is the actor uh, factor, whether this uh, uh, discourse or rhetoric value of the carbon is exploited by state actors or by non-state actors. So a point that maybe deserve attention is that all climate not all, but most of the climate um, actions involve very complicated networks and alliances between the state actor and non-state actor. And there is the observation on the increasingly um, more uh, obscure boundaries between the state and non-state uh, sphere. So in this conceptual framework, uh, the non-state actors, they represent the more resistant or the uh, non-state actors who hold different views or different perceptions of the low carbon agenda uh, against or in, uh, com in comparison with the state uh, actors. And uh, what, what we use at in, as the empirical evidences is the legal disputes. And we looked for, uh, looked into the legal disputes uh, under the China's administrative litigation law. So this law is to adjudicate uh, administrative action taken by an administrative agency or as employee against which a citizen, legal person, or any other organization files a complaint. So basically, this is a formal channel for non-state actors, individuals, and enti uh, different entities to claim their discontent or dissent with the administrative action, such as the climate control uh, taken by the, uh, the uh, government authorities. And we used a set of five keywords, uh, including climate change, greenhouse gas, low carbon, carbon emissions, and carbon trading uh, to identify that cases with possible relations to the topic we are uh, interested in. And we uh, find a total of the 341 adjudication, adjudications. And an interesting um, finding at this very early stage of the, uh, the search is that a majority of the <laughs> these cases are irrelevant. So this irrelevant represents maybe a plaintiff with a name, a company name, including low carbon and uh, a place uh, because when you uh, sue a government branch, you need to leave your address and the address has a name, including low carbon. So that are considered irrelevant. Also, there are more than 120 cases which use the climate change to indicating the variable weather conditions. So this is like um, the, the use of the climate change but with totally different meanings. And that are just, uh, uh, they, they want to claim that something is caused by the bad weather and the sudden change in the weather, but they use the same word of climate change and those, um, group of more than 120 cases, they are also considered as irrelevant and excluded from our further analysis. And by this search process, uh, we finally uh, located 94 disputes involving 152 adjudications. So maybe one dispute include uh, multiple trials and there is the uh, first and second instances, they are considered as one dispute because the reason the cause is the same. And we choose the period from 2010 to 2020, uh, as this is the first decade of low carbon uh, urban development and carbon control at the local level in China. And geographically, these cases are uh, distributed across 15 different provinces and 30 uh, cities. And we can see there is uh, the pilot province, the pilot low carbon provinces, and many of them are the pilot low carbon city under the NDRC's national pilot program. And uh, for the next step, we looked into each of these uh, 94 disputes and to look for what is it about? What is it 
uh, what is the articulation of the climate or carbon in uh, concrete uh, cases. And a uh, striking, but uh, in reflection, it is somehow very sense-making finding is that only a single dispute was about carbon emissions per se. So this single dispute is in uh, happened in Shenzhen, and it is about uh, an enterprise sued the municipal government to overcharge the carbon emissions fines. So this is because Shenzhen is one of the pilot city to implement carbon treaty. And for under this program, Shenzhen has the authority to uh, allocate carbon cap onto uh, the scale, uh, the, the companies and manufacturing with particular scale. And this is how the dispute arises. So they have the distance in the calculation results of the carbon emissions for that particular year. And except for this single dispute about the carbon emissions, all the other 93 disputes, they involve every kind of the activities. And the low carbon is used as a banner to denote low carbon building, low carbon transportation, and low carbon events, something like that. So this diverse uh, representation of the low carbon echoes or response to our hypothesis or our um, initial uh, intuition that low carbon is used as a rhetoric and there is tremendous symbolic value that can be exploited by both na uh, nation and, na and non-nation, uh, state or and non-state actors. And another point that corresponds to our conceptual uh, framework of the environmental state is that top leaders' speeches are playing a very um, prominent role in these cases. Both plaintiffs, um, the individuals, the companies, enterprises, and the courts they are using, uh, they are citing uh, the addresses or speeches uh, given by top leaders to focus on uh, the issue uh, of the low carbon development and low carbon city. And along the two dimensions in our conceptual framework, we find uh, four different rationales to articulating and explaining uh, low carbon um, on the ground. So the most prominent majority is the, the state use of carbon related reasons to revoke or change long established uh, practices. And this include how um, the, the government is using the uh, reason of the climate change to um, launch resettlement programs and also to uh, transfer the land use or transfer the land ownership and the, um, the type the, in the name of the low carbon development or for the construction of particular low carbon industry parks, <clears throat> sorry. And also this includes the suspension of uh, particular factories production act activities, as well as the residential heating provision uh, because of the low carbon reasons for the low carbon goal. And this is maybe if we extend the time frame of this research to the last year, maybe this can be seen more widely uh, because of the, um, the the carbon reduction goal and uh, ambitious and aggressive pursuit of this goal in the last year, which leads to the suspension of the heating provision in multiple cities in China. And uh, the second rationale entails the state's uh, prescription or prohibition of particular future events to curb carbon emissions. So this somehow um, resembles the most typical, typical uh, understanding of the environmental state building to institutionalize, to define and identify the new institutions and new governed subjects and new uh, governed objects uh, to um, pursue the environmental goals. And here we can only see, we only 
uh, find uh, four cases, including the one uh, with the carbon emission calculation dispute in Shenzhen, and also the other three is the uh, city is using the low carbon framing to stop or to reject the application of the vehicle uh, use permit. And at the same time, we can see also very active pursuit of the low carbon costs uh, by non-state actors and for the non-state actors to question uh, the, some policy implementation, some particular activities taken by the government. And we call this carbon rationalization. This denotes non-state actors use of climate related reasons to justify their own actions and claiming claims, uh, which are are existent. For example, uh, nine informal rat sharing um, drivers, they just claim their, uh, justify their activity of the provide uh, share uh, rat sharing because this contributes to low carbon transportation. And they cite this low carbon transportation as one of the national priority uh, claimed by the central government. So what I did, uh, is uh, contributive to this national goal. And also seven uh, cases, in seven cases, the property owners of the informal buildings are defend, uh, defended their uh, property and building structures uh, because of the materials uh, of the building are low carbon or they are located in a low carbon city project. So this is the kind of the, uh, the third rationale. And the last rationale is the nasty actors request for special treatment to, due to their low carbon future. And um, a group of the seven disputes from seven different cities, they use the um, various titles, the honorable titles, uh, which are listed here, uh, to ask for uh, exceptional treatment and uh, specifically the exception from the existing punishment and regulations because they have this kind of the identity uh, which uh, responds to uh, the goal of the carbon control. And also in the other four cases, we see uh, that um, individuals, uh, they question the existing um, regulatory framework to um, applied to be applied to particular innovative practice involving low carbon technologies. Uh, for example, one case is questioning the information disclosure scope of the developer because this development project is um, taken is carried out under the name of the low carbon city, a uh, low carbon community, uh, community and the other building, they acquired the green building uh, certificate. So uh, the uh, property buyers, they are requesting more information regarding the low carbon and green characters of these properties. And taken together, they are just very illustrative of the contested nature of the low carbon city uh, in contrast to uh, a very uh, straightforward uh, cascading flow of the power exertion as the traditional uh, understanding of the environmental state. And also we can see the most two prominent groups, they are actually stand in direct opposite with each other. When is the re-regulation, which is the government uh, branches, they are using uh, the rhetoric of low carbon to uh, rejudge and redecide uh, existing and past events. And on the other side is the, uh, re, uh, the, the carbon rationalization, which is the same, very similar activities, but taken by the non-state actors against uh, the authority of the government branches. And as this, as a result of this uh, contested nature and contestation process, urban climate mitigation governance entails not only absorbing and translating national priorities into local policies and programs, but also managing the emergent exploitation by diverse urban actors. 
And uh, this is a case study, a comparative case study between Shenzhen and Huizhou. Uh, but I think the time limits, I will just, uh, um, just briefly uh, introduce this, this case. And if you are interested in, uh, in more detailed information, the findings of this research is just uh, published by the Journal of Urban Affairs. And you can uh, maybe identify this article uh, to look for more information of your interest. And what we find generally uh, speaking is that all these four kinds of the rationales can be found um, their representation and articulation in both of the cases. And the divergent outcomes, the Shenzhen uh, can be said a uh, success because of the degree of the carbon reduction uh, in the past eight years since the establishment of the project uh, is very uh, impressive, um, over 80% of the carbon reduction intensity. And Xinxu's project just stopped at a very early stage and uh, just bankrupt in the end. So uh, when we take a very close look into how this happened, what can explain their divergent outcomes, we find that um, they are using the different strategies to uh, negotiate and connect and to orchestrate are uh, different rationales uh, hold, held by different actors. And we just uh, call this process of the negotiation and connecting um, between different rationales uh, as the localizing the low carbon state. So finally, I'd like to conclude with a couple of the observations during my studies, uh, studies on low carbon city. So the first, observation is that there is an emerging low carbon state. And this is low carbon state, we defined it as a decarbonization focused environmental state. But instead of a subcategory of the environmental state, we'd like to see it as a more like a variant of the environmental state because there are totally different rationale and logics within the low carbon state. Particularly low carbon state includes a lot of the green technology innovation and application in the real world. And also the whole project of the green economy, low carbon economy, and sometimes called circular uh, economy. So this integration of the economic growth and the balance between this, uh, they just uh, challenges the uh, long established binary of the growth versus degrowth in the discussion of the environmental state. So environmental state is also, is always seen as faced with a dilemma between the legitimacy, which is closely related to environmental governance and economic growth. So this binary relationship, they disappear or somehow dissolve in the observation of the low carbon state. So this low carbon state may contribute to a more exploration of the environmental state, the evolving nature and shifting priority in the era of the climate change. And the second conclusion is that effective urban climate action is contingent on the process of localizing the low carbon state. And the lack of successful localizing practice can to a large extent explain the persistent gap between the high promise and the disappointing reality of urban solution, urban response to climate change. And the last one is the planning implication. So as an uh, educated planner, uh, I always like to think uh, what is the implication and what is the what can we learn as the planning scholar and the pra uh, planning practitioners? So here and this uh, whole agenda of the low carbon urban development planning, uh, technically it is more related to the defining, selecting and negotiating the different multiple and sometimes contrasting or conflicting carbon rationalities held by different persons and appeared across different levels. So this might be a challenge for planning to do, uh, for planners to do um, 
both technically to calculate, uh, to use the new metrics of the carbon to imagine the future of the city and to measure the operation of the city and the governance of the city at one time, and also to critically think about the uh, undertone or the, uh, the meanings behind, the values behind this carbon uh, very uh, technically speaking and um, very quantifiable uh, material to represent uh, the well-being or the success of the cities. And also this can be contextualized into the discussion of the low carbon urbanism. And China's case is intriguing and not so representative in terms that uh, China has a very particular administrative and political environment and the environmental um, governance style is mm, very different uh, than other countries in the world. But also, China can be treated as an extreme case. So in China, theoretically, the carbon, which is seen as a quantifiable, uh, can be easily territorial, uh, territorialized into different uh, places. They theoretically can be implemented. The control of the carbon uh, should be uh, straightforward and easier at least easier than other places with the authoritarian character and the top-down uh, environmental management and the governance uh, structure. But in reality, this whole contested um, uh, contestation process and the, uh, the space crafted by this value and the symbolic uh, sim symbol of the carbon is tremendous in China. And what about the other places? Uh, when there can be more contestation and more storytelling and more utilization of the frame of the low carbon development to um, direct or drive uh, the different motivation and aspirations in the society. So I'd like to stop here and thank you uh, for your time. This is the reference list and I'd like to uh, welcome all the questions from the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. Um, I think you set a great example for students of, at GSAP to follow in your footsteps in regards to your Thank research. You. Um, if it's okay with you, uh, can we put the like, questions maybe at the end? We're running a little bit short on sure. time, uh, behind on sure, schedule. Sure, sure. So, mm -hmm. um, so next, we have the great pleasure to hear from Professor Nick Smith at Columbia's Barnard College. He, his work explores the politics of urbanization and planning in Asia, with a particular focus on contemporary China. His recently published book, The End of Village, Planning uh, the Urbanization of Rural China, investigates an epical shift in Chinese urban policy and its experimental implementation in Chongqing. His current research in the Shikou Industrial Zone re-examines the origins of China's rapid urbanization in the early reform era. All students here at Columbia interested in the study of Chinese urbanization would greatly benefit from auditing his class. Please welcome Professor Smith. Hi folks, uh, and thank you for that introduction. Uh, and thanks to uh, the Urban China Network for organizing this event and for the invitation. Uh, and to Professor Yang and Dr. Lee for very interesting presentations. This is a great panel. Um, I know we're uh, running a little bit behind on time, and so I'm going to do my best uh, to keep my remarks brief. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I look forward to uh, answering questions if there are any um, afterwards. So um, the theme uh, of this conference is sustainable urban planning, uh, and you know, I, I think Dr. Lee. Um, did a particularly good job of um, sort of giving us an understanding of um, of the treatment of sustainability from uh, in Chinese urbanization and planning um, from a more what I would say a conventional understanding of what sustainability is right in, in terms of the intersection of urbanization with environmental and ecological um, considerations um, current considerations around climate change etc. Uh, what I want to do uh, in this talk is um, look at the question of sustainability uh, in a slightly different sense um, than we usually uh, talk about it, to think instead about urbanization at a macro scale uh, and to ask what China's approach to urban planning requires uh, in order to sustain 
uh, that um, process of urbanization. Um, and that, in fact, to, to explore the possibility that the logic of Chinese urbanization, in fact, necessitates continuous expansion. And without that expansion, it would not be sustainable that actually the process of urbanization would um, sort of crumble under its own weight uh, in China. Though, of course, you know, from, from a more conventional uh, perspective, of course, that constant uh, expansion is itself unsustainable from an environmental perspective or it challenges uh, sustainability from an environmental perspective. Um, so let me uh, share my slides here. Uh, and uh, and just preface this uh, by saying that um, the sort of main claim uh, of, of my talk, uh, which is entitled The Urban Origins of China's Belt and Road Initiative, uh, is in essence that this necessity of constant urban expansion that is sort of written into Chinese urbanization, um, and specifically China's more recent efforts to um, expand urbanization beyond the, the sort of um, the coastal provinces that have been very highly urbanized and to instead now expand urbanization into the nation's late developing Western interior. That those processes um, are actually one of the main drivers of China's Belt and Road Initiative, also known as the BRI, uh, which China announced uh, in 2014. Uh, and so um, this argument is actually rooted in a larger ethnographic project uh, that I undertook in Chongqing, uh, primarily uh, in 2011 and 2012. Um, so, you know, here's uh, Chongqing in southwestern China. Uh, and, um, uh, and at that point, I was focused uh, primarily on the experimental implementation of something called urban rural coordination, or in Chinese, Chengxiang Tongchou. Uh, which was a new policy announced in the early 2000s uh, that was focused on the urbanization of rural areas, particularly in China's West, um, and has since been sort of updated. Uh, you might be more familiar with um, the National Plan for New Type Urbanization. The precursor to that national plan uh, was this policy of urban-rural coordination. Now, administratively, Chongqing is you know, as you probably know, one of the world's largest municipalities, it covers a territory nearly the size of Ireland with a population of about 32 million. Um, though, of course, the eponymous seat uh, of Chongqing, the actual city of Chongqing is significantly smaller. Uh, and, um, and when I was there doing research, I, I spent about 18 months there um, doing ethnographic field work, including interviews with you know, variety of urban planning uh, and urban development officials uh, in the municipal planning and policy establishment. Uh, and all of that resulted in um, this recent uh, book, The End of the Village, Planning the Urbanization of Rural China, which primarily focuses on the implications of urban rural coordinations for China's villages, um, how villages navigate uh, those changes uh, in China's urban development policy. Uh, the talk that I'm giving today is um, sort of an outgrowth of that project that instead, instead of um, scaling down to understand how urban rural coordination uh, in urban policy affects villages, instead scales up to understand how China's urban policy and approach to urban planning uh, uh, affects sort of larger regional and continental um, uh, practices and patterns of urbanization. Uh, and that uh, is, if you're interested in sort of reading more uh, about the arguments that I'm going to sort of briefly summarize today, um, uh, those arguments are available in this uh, recent paper in Urban Geography, uh, which is entitled Continental Metropolitanization, uh, Chongqing and the Urban Origins of China's Belt and Road Initiative. So as we know, uh, China has urbanized very rapidly uh, since the beginning of the reform era in 1978. Uh, but the benefits of urbanization have largely been concentrated along China's eastern coast. Uh, and this is, you know, in part a result from the pra relatively pragmatic ladder step uh, approach to development in the early reform era, 
which allowed coastal provinces, uh, which had more immediate access to global markets, to open up and to develop first. Uh, and then the idea being that the sort of central and western regions would catch up later as de development diffused or trickled down into the interior. Now, of course, the result of this has been rising inequality uh, with urban development concentrated primarily along the coast and rural poverty concentrated primarily in the interior and a widening gap uh, in terms of um, real income between uh, urban and rural areas. Uh, and that rising inequality um, leads to a variety of efforts to try to equalize um, development and urbanization across um, China's geography, um, both regionally and across the urban rural uh, divide. Uh, and so that really start like uh, sort of starts at a national level. Of course, there are sort of um, previous efforts at uh, regional and provincial levels, but the national effort really starts uh, with the Great Western Development Campaign in 1999. Um, and starting with that, starting with the Great Western Development Campaign, uh, we get this series of policy programs and approaches that seek to shrink that developmental gap, uh, largely through expanding infrastructural development uh, into the nation's interior. And so the idea here is that these investments are meant to help encourage the diffusion of economic development and urbanization into China's interior. Um, and, you know, there have been some successes, right? There have been sort of marginal gains um, in uh, marginal gains in sort of expanding development into the interior. And yet, on the whole, regional inequality and urban rural inequality have actually increased over the last 20 years. And that is at least in part because these programs have not fundamentally changed China's economic geography. They haven't fundamentally changed the structural advantages enjoyed by China's coastal provinces and cities, where port cities like Shanghai or Shenzhen remain the gateways to the global economy. And therefore, the expansion of China's infrastructure networks into the interior, you know, highways, high speed rail, et cetera rather than diffusing economic development into the interior, they actually end up enhancing the existing agglomeration advantages of the coast, of coastal cities, and make it easier for things like labor and goods to make their way from interior provinces to coastal cities, which um, you know, uh, already benefit from lower transaction costs and higher returns to capital. So that, that infrastructural expansion and these various development programs actually um, further aid uh, the urbanization and development advantages of the coastal cities rather than balancing development um, towards the interior. Now, um, <clears throat> excuse me, as one of the largest cities uh, in China's West, Chongqing has played a particularly prominent role uh, in these efforts to expand urban development into the interior, uh, in particular, starting with its designation as a provincial level um, municipality uh, in the late 90s. Uh, and then in part as a reflection of that, in the early 2000s, uh, Chongqing undertakes a new master plan uh, with the goal of doubling the size of uh, the central city of Chongqing uh, in both built land area and in population. Now, um, despite uh, that sort of uh, attention from the central government to try to establish Chongqing uh, as a growth pole in the West, despite these efforts around urban planning and urban, uh, urban expansion, Chongqing runs into much the same challenges that confront the larger Western development campaign, uh, where it, you know, where the city sort of really um, confronts a variety of barriers in trying to um, sort of achieve these goals in terms of urban expansion. Uh, and that tension that um, comes, comes to a head really in 2007, uh, when President Hu Jintao uh, 
really doubles down on the central government's plans for Chongqing in something that is known as the 314 scheme, uh, in which Hu Jintao pushes Chongqing's leaders to turn the city into, uh, to, to really achieve this plan to turn the city into uh, a growth pole for China's West. Uh, and in the years that follow uh, that moment in 2007, and really with the explicit support and approval of the central government, Chongqing's leaders embark on a series of quite ambitious uh, proposals to rethink how the city is approaching urban development. Uh, and so um, the, the idea here is really to um, model uh, the, uh, the prior practices of cities like Shanghai and the construction of the Pudong New Area, which you see here on the left with Lu Jiazui, and the approach that, Sh that Shanghai models in terms of international metropolitanization, right? Uh, and, and the leaders of Chongqing conclude that the city needs to essentially do the same thing, that they need to internationalize uh, Chongqing's economy in order to grow. And here you see um, a, a, a rendering of Jiang Beizue, which is you know, very clearly modeled uh, on Lu Jiazui uh, in, uh, in Shanghai. Now, um, the key difference between Chongqing's approach and Shanghai's approach is that instead of connecting to the global economy through existing maritime trade networks, which of course are dependent on port cities like Shanghai and Shenzhen. Chongqing proposes to instead connect to the global economy, but through China's continental land borders, resulting in what I refer to as continental metropolitanization. So similar to international metropolitanization, but instead um, based on uh, continental connections to uh, the larger continent of Eurasia. And so Chongqing's leaders developed this plan to become essentially a powerhouse in the production of notebook computers for the international market. And with a, within a few years, Chongqing is actually producing more than a third of all notebook computers worldwide, most of which are destined for the European market. Nevertheless, despite their intent to do this, right, they still have this problem because they still rely on, Shang, on places like Shanghai and Shenzhen to export their products, which requires you know, several days on a train in order to get to these ports, and then more than a month at sea in order to get to places like Europe, all of which puts Chongqing and its notebook producers at a distinct disadvantage compared to factories located along China's coasts, or in fact, elsewhere in the world, um, particularly given the high turnover nature of the personal computing market. And so they embark on this um, alternative export path, which is by rail through Central Asia and Eastern Europe to the port of Rotterdam. Uh, and the physical rail infrastructure to do this actually already exists, right? There's already a rail line um, that connects from Chongqing to Rotterdam, um, but it's very difficult to traverse, right? All of the different rail gauges in these different countries, all these different customs regimes as you cross one border and another, make it very difficult and slow to use this, this export pathway. And so, in fact, in anticipation of one of the core features of the Belt and Road Initiative, which emphasizes institutional coordination, alongside the construction of physical infrastructure, Chongqing's leaders convene all of these different countries along with a variety of, of national ministries in China uh, to harmonize everyone's different rail and customs management in order to make it possible to load a train in Chongqing and unload it, it, and, and unload it in Rotterdam just 16 days later. And that is in fact, more than twice as fast as the overseas export route. And so, you know, uh, this freight line, which is now called China Express, uh, starts running in 2011. It now serves many different cities in, in China, but it originates in Chongqing. 
And Chongqing's leaders in 2000, 2011 start referring to it as the new Silk Road. And you know, they readily admit that they're not the first ones to use this term, uh, but they claim to be the first ones to actually put it into practice. Uh, and this is then followed by plans for a second of these freight lines originating in Chongqing that would run through Myanmar to the Indian Ocean. And that second freight line, actually, it never, it has not yet materialized because uh, as opposed to the Central Asian freight line, um, the physical infrastructure for that second rail line doesn't yet exist and has run into a variety of political um, difficulties. Um, but it is, it's on the basis of this idea, of there being these two uh, rail lines running from Chongqing, uh, that Chongqing starts articulating something called the one river, two flanks, three oceans strategy. The idea being that by connecting the Yangtze River corridor, uh, which is this economic corridor that connects Chongqing to Shanghai, so connecting the Yangtze River economic corridor to these two freight lines, Chongqing would become, in essence, the economic fulcrum for China, connecting the Chinese economy to the Pacific Ocean, the Indian Ocean, and the Atlantic Ocean. Now, as Chongqing's leaders emphasized, um, this approach is meant to finally allow China's West to escape its economic dependence on the coast, right? That, um, that sort of coastal advantage that I talked about earlier, and to finally fulfill the promise of the Great Western Development Campaign. Um, and it also, in many ways, anticipates the two-pronged structure of the larger Belt and Road Initiative, where we have the Silk Road economic belt in the north and the Maritime Silk Road in the south, right? It looks very similar to this one river, two flanks, three ocean strategy. And in fact, when you know I was uh, in Chongqing in 2015, talking to a variety of urban development of, of officials, one of the things that was getting talked about a lot was how um, you know the the BRI, which had just been announced in 2014, was in many ways modeled on Chongqing's internationalization efforts. Now, in addition to these rail lines, there are a number of other initiatives uh, that Chongqing also pursued, including expanded air freight connections. Uh, Chongqing's airport becomes the largest air freight um, airport in, uh, in Western China, uh, as well as an effort to build up Chongqing as a cloud computing hub um, and as a global center for uh, financial accounting services uh, in with the original intent. Um, and it's particularly true in the west of the city. Uh, so this is the the central core of Chongqing, right? The historical core. Um, and these various internationalization efforts um, really aid urban expansion in the West, much of which is established as a tax-free export zone, which is actually the, the physical terminus of the China Express rail line. And then also expansion in the North. Uh, including another export zone that uh, joins uh, Chongqing's airport. Uh, and then finally, also this new financial center um, just across the, the river from Chongqing's historical downtown. And that's the Jiangbeizue um, Financial Center, which is modeled on Lu Jiazue in Shanghai. And of course, all of that adds up to this gigantic expansion in Chongqing's scale, concentrating the municipality's population of 32 million within a one hour circle of, of travel time around the central city of Chongqing uh, and turning the city of Chongqing into the first Western city uh, with more than 10 million inhabitants. Now, of course, um, the Belt and Road's Road Initiative's urban implications are by no means limited to Chongqing. Uh, and another part of um, this investigation explores how the BRI has been explicitly conceived as a driver of urbanization throughout China's West, uh, it, where the BRI's international infrastructure, all of these different rail lines and highways and economic corridors that expand beyond China's um, borders, are really meant to transform the Eurasian continent 
into an expanded economic hinterland for domestic Chinese urban development. And all of that international infrastructure is, um, is conceived of as an, really an extension of existing domestic infrastructural networks, which of course China has already been expanding over the past 20 years, in large part as um, part of the Great Western Development Campaign. And then as a result of that, these various inland cities in the West are serving as essentially as catchment areas for newly enabled trade in the Southwest and in the Northwest. Uh, and so that all drives you know, the metropolitan expansion of these various cities, similar to how it's driving metropolitan expansion in Chongqing. And that in, in turn, that metropolitan expansion then in turn drives regional integration across multiple cities. And so for instance, in the Southwest, we get um, the regional uh, uh, urban mega region of Dianzhong, which is centered on Kunming uh, and is you know, conceived of as the economic capital of Southeast Asia. And then in the Northwest, we get Guangzhou centered on Xi'an, Xianyang, Lanzhou, uh, which is understood as sort of a catchment area for Centra Central Asia. Uh, and then those two urban mega regions in turn feed into uh, the Chengyu Gui uh, mega region, which connect, connects Chengdu, Chongqing, and Guiyang uh, through this newly operational high speed rail. And together, those three mega regions now form, in essence, this new inland economic belt that is meant to parallel uh, the uh, and, and balance the historical coastal economic belt that has, has historically anchored China's development with, of course, the Pearl River Delta in the south, the Yangtze River Delta, and then the Bohai region, now Xinjiangzi. And of course, in all of this, we come back to Chongqing, which really serves as that fulcrum point that ties this new inland economic belt into the Yangtze River corridor um, and down to Shanghai. Now, um, the last point that uh, I just want to make uh, briefly before wrapping up uh, is to uh, conclude with um, a few words about how this in investigation might speak to um, larger bodies of uh, literature in urban studies and urban planning. The first thing that I would say is that I think it's quite tempting to see this as you know, a relatively straightforward example of what we might otherwise call state rescaling. Both the scaling up of transformational infrastructure networks and scaling down to empower municipal development policy and urban expansion. And I think there's actually quite a bit of wisdom to that, right? The, the BRI is a powerful example of the dialectically intertwined movements of, on the one hand, internationalization and extensification, and on the other hand, urbanization and intensification as twinned response, responses to crises of capital accumulation. But I actually think the BRI takes on a slightly different character when we start to look at it through the lens of post-colonial urban studies where conventional accounts of state rescaling talk about the strategic repositioning of cities within global economic hierarchies without really challenging the stability of those hierarchies themselves, right? Uh, in the conventional sort of state rescaling literature, New York and London remain the center of the global economy. By contrast, post-colonial urban studies seeks ways to you know, ontologically destabilize those hierarchies, to use novel epistemological and methodological techniques to generate new geographies of theory that recenter urban studies away from those conventional centers of urban power, places like New York and London. And in a way, the BRI tries to accomplish in practice what post-colonial urban studies has sought to achieve theoretically. So through the production and integration of this 
you know, nearly planetary urban network, the BRI ultimately aspires to transform the global urban hierarchy itself. Not only rescaling urban regions and infrastructures for greater competitive advantage within the existing hierarchy, but also recentering global economic networks away from those historical nodes of urban primacy in Europe and North America and toward these new continental metropoles, cities like Chongqing in China. And so China has in essence flipped the script of state rescaling, creating this whole new global geography of interurban competition at the same time that it is also restructuring urban regions in its Western interior to take leading roles in that recentered future. Okay, I'm gonna um, stop there and I look forward to your questions. Thanks. Thank you so much, Professor uh, Smith. Um, we have, a, we'll, we'll be opening up, up to questions for both Professor Smith and Dr. Lee. Um, and I believe there is a direct question for uh, Professor Smith right away from Christian. Okay, I will read it for him. Uh, do you think there is a possibility of the rail line replacing the maritime route, especially considering how much higher and simpler the capacity of the maritime trade is? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I am certainly not claiming that the, the rail line is gonna replace maritime trade, right? Um, and in fact, one of the things to know about the China Express route is that it um, very much relies on state subsidies in order to ma um, maintain sustainability, maintain its economic sustainability. And that is in large part because the volume of trade from China to Europe is much higher than the volume of trade from Europe to China. And so a lot of those trains go back to China empty, right? Uh, and so it requires subsidization in order to be able to maintain. Nevertheless, you know, China has the economic wherewithal to continue to maintain those subsidies. And as long as they do, it's transforming global economic geographies. And at a certain point, you're going to have the path dependencies such that, you know, those global economic geographies will be sustainable. So I do think that, you know, it's not going to replace maritime trade, uh, but it's certainly going to become, you know, an important alternative. And particularly when we're thinking about, you know, questions of climate change, um, maritime trade is a huge contributor to climate change. And that rail infrastructure, um, well, while not, you know, carbon neutral, uh, is, you know, putting quite a bit less carbon into the atmosphere um, to get, you know, goods from China to Europe. So, um, you know, I do, I think there are a variety of ways in which that rail route um, will be important in the future. Great, thank you. Um, I see a question from Professor Wu. Yes, um, thank you, uh, Nick and uh, Yunjing. Um, I have actually a comment for Nick and a question for Yunjing. So Nick, I, I am thrilled that you are um, uh, expanding the work and looking into the implications of BR, um, you know, Belt and Road. Uh, I, I'm just, uh, so, so, I mean, I think your interpretation is in a sense, the impact the, of the initiative will potentially reshape, right? The urban uh, hierarchy, although I, I, I I think the fundamentally the initiative is about energy security and is about geo, geopolitical um, realignment. So I just, I feel that maybe the urban is not as central. Um, and so just sort of a point of debate that we can have offline some other time. So for Yunjing, uh, I'm thrilled also to see that um, you have expanded your doctoral research and, and especially uh, by using Wenshu Wang. I happen to also have been using that as well. 
And so I'm wondering um, if there is a timing issue here that you only had something like 90 some cases, because when I was looking at Wenshu, especially on land dispute, it's just millions, I don't know, tens of thousands. And so I was only able to focus on Shanghai. And, uh, but then again, land issue arise, you know, arose much, much early, decades earlier. And the issue of low carbon um, and also the, the actual sort of going to courts to challenge environmental issues, um, it's much more recent. So, I, I mean, how, how do you actually uh, sort it through these cases, right? Because I don't actually, I did not, never saw the, you know, environmental issues as the categories of organization of cases on Wenshu Wang. And so, um, so I was very curious about your methodology of using that data source. Hello, question, Professor Lee. Uh, so the number, because I think the, this is the uh, filtering process I took. So first, because I want to, I'm interested in the contradiction and contestation, contestation between the government authorities and non-state actors. So I only looked into the legal dispute just under the administrative, uh, administrative litigation law. So only I looked at only one kind of law, which is a formal channel for uh, individuals to uh, sue against government uh, administrative action. I think that is maybe one reason why the number is limited. And the second reason might be um, there are too many irrelevant as I search through the process. There are so many using the low carbon as only a name of the company, a name of the place, a name of an organization. And also as I find uh, in the first stage of the search that climate change is like It's not like a climate change, climate change, but like the weather change. And there is not a very exceptional cases on this use of the climate change, but a whole bunch of the cases, more than 120 cases, using the same word uh, of the climate change, to denote there is a bad weather. So I just delayed my arrival to some particular places and caused some legal outcome or legal uh, effects. So maybe I think that might also can, uh, can explain why the number is uh, limited. So the, for the next step, maybe when the low carbon is and carbon control becomes a, a agenda or a, an issue that penetrating into different aspects of the, um, the society, maybe there are other kinds of the uh, the laws and the which the the, uh, the disputes will be sued and judged, and that may be more uh, provide more empirical evidences to look at this different interpretations of the low carbon city. Wonderful, and I think that's a wonderful segue for me to open up the discussion. Um, so we're going to, uh, I, I have a question for both of you, um, and that is we're constantly thinking about ways to future-proof cities from an economic and em environmental perspective, and both of you have the unique perspectives of scholars who have lived and stayed extensively in the United States and China. What are some of the strengths of each country's um, from an urban sustainability perspective um, and your research perspective, and what are some aspects that we can learn from each other? And either of you can go first. So maybe I can provide some very naive or intuitive uh, reflections uh, to this uh, question. So I think learning is really hard. And uh, not only learning across different culture uh, and social context, also learning from your own past or learning from your once um, failure or success, that kind of the replication is extremely difficult to achieve. And I think this 
might be somehow demonstrated by how we deal with the COVID, right? So, and then, and I think in this different uh, Chinese cities and US cities, I think this learning sometimes is like a counterpart, but in a different context. And the learning might cause some unexpected outcomes. And also in the name of the same concept, for example, the climate and sustainability, that might be articulated by different uh, approaches and strategies and tactics uh, on the ground. So I'm not going to say that I'm a, um, not a believer in the power of learning, but I just want to uh, recognize that the difficulty of that and what does learning mean uh, when we want to uh, replicate the successful experiences from one place to another. So I don't know whether I have already answered the question or just raised new questions. Yeah, I, I, I think I have um, sort of a, a similar sentiment uh, to share as Yun Jing, um, which is, you know, the balance between both the necessity of thinking across contexts in order to be able to learn, but also the real care that you need to take in making those comparisons, and that there is a lot of sort of misunderstanding or epistemic violence that can result from sort of uncareful comparison. And I think that is one of the things that, you know, contemporary urban studies has really been centrally concerned with over the last 10 to 15 years is how we go about the practice of comparison. And, you know, I, I appreciated in your question that it wasn't a, a unidirectional question, right? I think 10 or 15 years ago, it would have been a unidirectional question, right? What can China learn from the United States? And, and I think now it really needs to be a mutual conversation, right? There are things that, that the US can learn from China as well. Um, and it is not, I don't think it is even so much about sort of concrete practices so much as it is about sort of what China, what truths China reveals about the United States and, and vice versa, what truths the US reveals about China when we, when we start thinking about them comparatively, when we use China as a lens for thinking about the US and the US as a lens for thinking about China, um, I think we can start to see actually some, we, we, we can start to think uh, in, uh, in more imaginative ways to, to sort of conceive alternative futures rather than be sort of locked into the way that things are. So for instance, one of the things that, you know, I, I think China helps understand about the US is our sort of ideological commitment to um, the inviolability of private property rights, which I think is one of the real stumbling blocks for, you know, real fundamental transformation on a lot of different things uh, in the contemporary United States, including climate change, responding to climate change and you know a variety of issues uh, in the realm of social justice including um, you know housing affordability um, and you know I, I think China with its you know system of state owned land uh, uh, state land ownership uh, in urban areas um, and the the role that the party plays uh, in um, urban development and the the real estate market uh, I think really shines a light on the the extent to which um, the the exercise of private property rights is really a is is a is a is is really political in the United States in a way that we don't often recognize right we often sort of just like put it in an economic bucket we say the market's going to take care of that but actually those choices to just let the market take care of it that's a political choice and I think um, I think 
using China as a lens for the United States really exposes that, just as an example. Thank you both for answering that very difficult question. Um, so my next question is more for Dr. Lee. Um, the env term environmental authoritarianism is very interesting to me because it indicates a continuation of a more top-down planning style in China. We here at Columbia are increasingly looking at the movement of climate justice um, from the streets and by populations that are more vulnerable to climate racism, which in the U.S. intersects with discrimination towards racialized groups and low-income groups. And as an alumni of GSAP, who actually formerly worked on community outreach initiatives such as UTAP, do you see any movements of civic groups towards climate justice in Hong Kong or mainland China? Um, and, and how do these two differ? Ooh, that is a very interesting question. So this kind of the bottom-up initiative to not only tackle the problem of the climate change, but also tackle the uneven distribution of the uh, other effects and the costs of climate solutions. I think that is a very uh, emerging topic in the uh, scholarly discussion, and we can see an increasing number of the empirical cases uh, in the US and as well as the uh, Europe. And in Hong Kong, I also see this kind of the things that are happening toward the goal of the climate mitigation or adaptation, but it is not, it is not conducted under the name of the climate justice. And that is very interesting to me because sometimes you say a thing, uh, you carry on a title, but what you do is maybe not uh, actually toward that end, but sometimes you can do something that worked for a particular go, but even without the acknowledgement of the functioning of the uh, action or activity to what it go. So I like to see many interesting uh, initiatives uh, uh, in the civil society in Hong Kong who are claiming for uh, working for uh, the, uh, the justice in terms of the food, uh, especially healthy food uh, distribution and provision across different income groups. And also, uh, I can see in China, there are some top-down initiatives but targeted toward particular dis uh, historically disadvantaged uh, social groups. Uh, and uh, the overall agenda of the uh, poverty alleviation, and that is how to develop, for example, how to develop renewable energy in the historically very poor uh, rural uh, and countryside areas. But uh, as I mentioned, that is not a always very clear direction or connection between the activities going on and uh, the goal of the climate justice. As the concept of the climate justice, I don't see so many um, organizations or uh, action um, in China or Hong Kong with this very explicit, uh, explicit um, title or aim of the climate justice. Thank you. That is very, very enlightening. And I think we have a question in the Zoom chat from uh, Mr. Richard Jordan. Uh, would you like to speak, uh, like, like say it yourself? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, uh, can you uh, can you see me and hear me? Yes, you can. I think, Professor Smith, um, does the concept of global citizenship? Uh, help to expand this idea of intercontinental trade routes. I'm thinking that shared human destiny is another uh, way of talking about uh, trade routes, perhaps. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know about shared human destiny. Uh, the question of citizenship uh, is definitely a central one. Um, and, you know, I, I think it is noteworthy that in the context of the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, that those various institutional collaborations are enabling the free flow of goods, technology, capital, right, along these infrastructural corridors. 
but not necessarily labor or people. Uh, and that there remain important distinctions in terms of personal mobility and the mobility of labor. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that is something to keep an eye on as the Belt and Road Initiative progresses and as international migration, as the international migration of labor to China increases, particularly as China seeks to wind down the hukou system and the exploitation of rural hukou holders as a part of China's larger sort of manufacturing economy. Um, and I think one of the implications of that is that, you know, China's, uh, China's manufacturing economy potentially becomes more dependent on international migration along many of these same infrastructural routes. Uh, and then the question becomes, you know, what policies are put in place in terms of the selective permeability of international borders? Um, and so, you know, all of that is TBD. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, I have uh, maybe a last question and I'll go to the closing remarks of um, the Urban China Forum this year. Um, first of all, thank you so much, Professor Smith and Dr. Lee for an inspiring lecture. Um, personally, I see the issue of scale in both of our presentations, whether in Dr. Lee's uh, approach, the failure of large scale urban um, intervention, adopting new, um, this low carbon or even zero carbon um, concept. Uh, for example, the recent failure of Dongtan City experiment in Shanghai, or in Professor Smith, your presentation, the failure of high speed railroad in balancing urban and rural inequality. On the other hand, the macro intervention that Professor Yang mentioned seems to be relatively more, I would say, successful in terms of its implementation. Um, do you all believe that this is the issue of scale in terms of governance or geographical terrain that will largely impact how we approach urban sustainability? Thank you. Can you rephrase the question? I oh, I don't know that I, I totally understand what it is you're trying to sure. ask. Yes. Um, so I was more thinking about um, like all the three presentations all together through the lens of scale, the scale of urban intervention, whether it is through um, a small intervention like um, what Professor Young had mentioned, those um, little um, uh, interventions that they did for the neighborhood or in a larger scale intervention, for example, the um, the rail, the high speed railroad uh, system across the country, or um, in Dr. Lee's um, kind of approach, this um, adaptation of low carbon um, at a, a city or like a governance level, uh, while seeing the very recent uh, exper experiment um, or call it like a failure of Dongtan City, uh, which is designed to be the first zero carbon city in China. Um, I see this scale difference in terms of how we approach urban sustainability. And do you think this is one thing that we should think about uh, for you know, how effective, I would say, an approach is uh, working towards that? Yeah, so I mean, certainly scale is, is an important dimension uh, and we need to think about it. I don't think that we can, um, I don't think that we can think about sort of different scales and isolation from each other. And in fact, if you, know, you read the urban geography literature, um, you know, there's been a sort of turn in terms of thinking about scale over the last 10 or 20 years from thinking of scales as these sort of like self-contained units as either like macro or, or, or micro, and instead of thinking about scale relationally, right? That what, it, what really matters is not necessarily whether it's like, whether it's tiny scaled or big scaled, but rather the relationship between different scales. And so, you know, I, I think that would be my, my initial response, which is that um, any of these interventions can't be limited to one scale of operation, right? You can build 
the biggest, fastest high-speed rail network. But if you are not also working at a metropolitan scale to understand how urban development is going to intersect with that, or working at a community scale to understand like how the station is going to interact with the community, um, the, the high-speed rail network is not going to have you know uh, the effect that you want it to. Uh, and so I think it is really you know important to be thinking relationally across these scales and how they intersect with each other. Thank you. I think I totally agree with uh, Professor Smith about uh, this relational uh, perspective on scale. So uh, scale, so in the scholarly discussion uh, in recent years, it is challenging at uh, the view of scale as a spatial unit or like a container to hold uh, a kind of a, a particular amount of the things, entities, materialities in a specific um, spatial unit. Uh, instead, scale, I think, is, entails more dynamic uh, between different scales. And uh, in climate, uh, urban climate governance from my uh, area, we always talk about how to upscale uh, the good practices uh, found in uh, on the ground, how to make a good practice replicable or generalizable to other things that we call this kind of the uh, upscaling process. And this dynamic view on scale, I think uh, it is sometimes um, a little difficult for uh, planning practitioners I think that may be uh, one point I would like to mention as a planner, a trained planner, because for planners, we always have a concrete project. And this concrete project always has a physical and geographic boundaries. And there is a path dependence for a particular planner. When you uh, get into the field and get into this profession and started to uh, make planning for a particular uh, size or a particular level of the spatial unit, you are going to, um, it's more likely that you are going to do the uh, projects of the similar <laughs> level or similar scale. Um, in this, so it is somehow very challenging for practitioners to think across the scales, to think out of the scale uh, you are working on in terms of the physical boundaries of the projects, but to the more contextual factors on a broader uh, range, in a broader context, how that kind of the force is related to what you have at hand. I think that is what, what um, my understanding of the scale. So thank you. Thank you both for your responses. Um, so on behalf of the entire Urban China Network team, um, thank you, Professor Jin Yang, um, Dr. Li Wingjing, and Professor Nick Miss for enlightening lectures today. We're so appreciative of all of you taking your time on a Saturday morning or evenings to speak to us here at Convergy Zap. We also thank the audiences that either joined online or in person today. Urban sensibility and effects of urban regeneration and environmental destruction or urban, on urban areas is increasingly focused on, on in China and around the world and at the front front of governance and economic concerns. Yesterday, we explored the involving role of different levels of governance, as well as issues of environmental preservation as part of methods for urban sensibility in China. While well, today we are here to discuss the complex spatial and social processes of urban regeneration and transformation including the history of the various phases, conservation of the present, and the economic infrastructure initiatives of the future. This allows us to understand a bit more about how the evolving dynamics of urban renewal impacts both aging and new cities across the country. Despite the limitation of on-site research, events like this encourage scholars from around the world to engage in researching Chinese cities, which serve as both experiential laboratory and exciting frontier of sustainable urban planning and uh, for the urban regeneration. We want to also give special thanks to Professor Wei Ping Wu for her support and her leadership in making GSAP urban planning the, the diverse program it is today. We couldn't have done this without her. We really appreciate hearing the insightful research of the three professors and we're sure it will be very useful for the students' future research. If any other students have questions about this, please let us know on WeChat or by email. 
um, and if it's okay with the professors, Urban China Network will forward the questions to you guys. Um, thank you all again for your participation today and hope you guys have a nice day um, slash night. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Nick Smith, uh, unfortunately, Dr. Lee can't really fly in from Hong Kong to join us uh, at our reception, but if Professor Nick Smith, if you would like to come, we're in Fairweather 209. Um, there's plenty of food left. Is there? Yeah, there's plenty of food left. So if you would like to join, come over for some food, we'd, we would love to, we'd love to chat. Okay, I'll try to make it over. Okay, all right. <laughs> Have a good afternoon, everybody. Thank you.